The unaffordability of housing is something that regularly swings into the mainstream, and understandably so. Housing costs have increased 72% on average across the country since the 1970s. But before I explain how housing can be made more affordable, some background on why this is from the supply side. Using data from the Office of Federal Housing Oversight, there is about a 1% increase per year in housing quality. But this can really only explain about 25% of the reasoning behind home price increases of about 4% over the same period. Much of it can be explained by the value of land. In 1990, in Sacramento, only about 53% of the home's value could be attributed to the actual value of the structure sitting on the land. By 2000, there was 27 metro areas where the cost of the structure made up no more than 60% of the total value. Virtually all of California fits into this, with San Francisco being the absolute top, at the value of the structure being only about 30% of the house's value. This is a supply and demand issue. Census data shows that during the 1950s, just before the sharp rise in housing prices, Los Angeles increased the amount of housing by about 60%. By the 1990s, this was under 10%. And while Los Angeles may be an outlier, there is evidence to show that housing construction has gone down majorly across the United States. In the same span of time, the median rate, which started at 40%, fell to 14% by the 1990s. No longer is it the case that with surging housing prices comes new development. Why is that? Three-fourths of zoned land in U.S. cities prohibit anything other than single-family detached dwellings. Townhomes, duplexes, and towering apartment buildings are all banned. Even in places in which these are allowed, they are often met by height capping, minimum lot sizes, or parking requirements, which completely destroys the financial feasibility of developing multi-unit housing. The growing regulation of land use actively harms the poorest and most vulnerable, with less and less people being able to afford to move to seek new jobs, shrinking the economy by an estimated 14%. The former chairman of the chief economic advisors to the White House has said, quote, While land use regulations sometimes serve reasonable and legitimate purposes, they can also give extra normal returns to entrenched interests at the expense of everyone else. Zoning regulations and other local barriers to housing development can allow a small number of individuals to capture the economic benefits of living in a community, thus limiting diversity and mobility. Local governments can effectively zone out lower class people or things like homeless shelters that they deem undesirable to the character of the neighborhood. This has long-reaching effects, with a study finding that loosening zoning regulations would narrow the school test score gap by 7 percentage points, allowing low-income students more opportunities for success, but more on nimbyism later. In Washington, D.C., a common practice is buying old single-family home lots and renovating them into walk-ups or other types of multi-unit housing. Say a one-family lot can be bought for $1 million, $1 million per unit in single-family zoning. Say the developer decides to turn it into a small six-unit apartment block, Demolition and rebuilding would cost them approximately $3 million. A previously single unit for $1 million is now six units at 40% less. This process is demonized as gentrification, but doing this citywide in a place like San Jose would greatly reduce rent and unit prices across the city. Expanding the market for housing can greatly reduce home prices, but that doesn't mean that they become any more accessible to the lowest quartile of the population. According to HUD, people who make about $20,000 a year should spend no more than $500 a month on housing. This is a near impossibility in most cities in the United States. There are a few proposed ways of solving this, such as raising EITC payouts, increasing the minimum wage, or adding to the voucher program. Back to NIMBYism. It can be the fault of the local residency. The increasing power of residential activists to block large-scale projects has only been exacerbated by the veritable media circus that is regularly run. Local governments become hell-bent on disrupting new housing and, quote, turning normal projects into a PR disaster, which scares away investors. With court cases challenging regulation regularly being ruled in favor of restrictive zoning, courts whose judges share the same environmental attitudes as the middle class were more sympathetic to claims that local decision had failed to account for the environmental impacts than they had been to seemingly selfish claims that their home values were at risk. And obviously, this isn't the environment in the natural sense, but in the, quote, character of the neighborhood sense. And of course you can be sympathetic. Even a metropolitan queer yuppie like me can see why. 68% of debt liabilities are in home mortgages, and nearly all non-financial asset values are in the value of homes. But again, not necessarily in the actual value of the home, but the land it's sitting on. That's why in conjunction with allowing supply increases in housing, it is critically important that municipalities implement a land value tax. Unlike your typical property tax, which charges based on the value of the land and the value of the buildings on it, the land value tax increases the taxation on land, but greatly reduces the tax on structures on the land. For example, if you own a random lot in a city like Los Angeles or New York City, 
Under the typical model of property taxes, you'd just be taxed on the land, because if you improve it, you have to pay more. So you can just sit on top of this veritable cash cow and wait for the value to appreciate. Under land value taxation, however, the tax would be roughly the same if the land was made into apartments, shops, or whatever else. In Clareton, Pennsylvania, the land value tax reduced the tax burden on owner-occupied residences and multifamily units, while the vacant properties in the city helped triple the budget of the city government, completely inversing the tax burden from the residents to the speculators taking advantage of them. This can be used in the multi-unit example as follows. It would incentivize the holders of single-family dwellings to sell to developers who would develop them into units, and then the tax bill would be split equally among those six units rather than just the one. There is even evidence to suggest that land value taxes can decrease commute times, because as density increases, more people are able to live closer to work, not being forced out of the city entirely. There are numerous solutions to the issue, but at its core it is a supply and demand problem. There are, however, equitable ways to solve the housing crisis in the market. Unlike some would have you believe, the incredible cost of housing isn't a tautological consequence of the market's existence. It is a complex problem with no clear solution. But the deregulation of zoning and land value taxation is clearly one of the best ways we have.